Um, today I'll talk about uh, evaporation from uh, porous surfaces. Um, and I'll try and tell the story of evaporation from the porous medium point of view, uh, simply because much, much of what we know um, in textbooks and others uh, 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 about evaporation tends to focus on the atmospheric side, measuring gradients or uh, evaporation response to vapor pressure deficit and so on. Um, and often, not always, treating the porous medium as a passive supplier of vapor. And in fact, um, the um, interactions within porous medium and resistances that arise within the porous medium uh, play a major role in modulating the fluxes and uh, not only determining the dynamics, but also the um, ultimate uh, evaporative losses. So um, in uh, today's talk, uh, I'll uh, try and create a link between uh, two uh, processes involving evaporation from uh, pores, from discrete pores, um, uh, and those will involve both uh, plants, uh, uh, porous medium, and uh, uh, a biotic porous surface, that is uh, plant leaves. So this is a change from the uh, declared um, topic uh, for this uh, conference. I uh, apologize for not announcing earlier. Um, the scale at which uh, the process I'll be talking about uh, will be the uh, pore scale, uh, but I believe that many of the nonlinearities will be pointing out scale up both the, uh, to the um, macroscopic scale, in fact, to, in fact, even to the remote sensing scale, and I'll show how this actually works. Um, um, I'd like, of course, to acknowledge my co-author, Shmuel Asulin, who is here, and uh, Peter Lehmann from ETH. So first, let me put this uh, problem in a context, the global context first. Oh, of course, I have to. Um, as you know, uh, global evaporation uh, consumes about 25% of the solar energy uh, arriving to the planet, which is a huge consumer of energy. It is also the uh, entry point to the uh, hydrologic cycle. And evaporation uh, over terrestrial surfaces um, uh, sends back to the atmosphere about 60% of the terrestrial re precipitation. Uh, it would be uh, interesting for uh, the plant people here to uh, recognize. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I'll do it. Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, it would be uh, important for the plant people to recognize, of course, that 40% uh, of that uh, evaporation goes through the plant tissue. So plants are the biggest movers of water, of course. Uh, another point to remember here in the context is that the atmosphere serves as an almost an infinite sink that relentlessly pulls uh, vapor into the, into the atmosphere, of course. So that's a, that's an, uh, uh, a driver that sits there um, all the time. And the, of course, the question of the motivation is uh, uh, how much of the physics of this very important process do we really understand? Now, evaporation is important not only for the ecophysiology, hydrology, but also for many other industrial engineering processes from drying of wood to keeping your cookies from drying and stuff like that. And we know quite a bit about evaporation. But even now, uh, modelers among you will admit that predicting evaporation rate for porous materials from first principles is still a challenge. And the reason it is a challenge is because uh, for, even for the same boundary condition, you set a, a porous sample in the same, under the same boundary conditions, the resulting fluxes, here this is evaporation rate versus say mass loss or time, uh, shows very large uh, dynamics. Uh, we understand what the origin of these dynamics they represent uh, differences in uh, transport processes. For example, here, the nearly constant rate, we know, we call it constant rate period of evaporation, involving capillary flow to the surface followed by an abrupt uh, transition to a diffusion-limited uh, uh, evaporation of vapor transport uh, controlled by diffusion. Uh, so we know these uh, things, but we don't really know uh, when this transition takes place, what are the controls over this transition, and so on. So this, this is part of the challenge. Uh, part of the confusion, I think, uh, rests with the fact that uh, we are not distinguishing enough uh, the differences between evaporation from terrestrial surfaces, and I'll and I use terrestrial for porous surfaces and free water surfaces. There are fundamental differences. One is that terrestrial surfaces dry during evaporation. And second, uh, water is being withdrawn from within the porous medium to the surface for the evaporation. But perhaps the most important difference is that ultimately, evaporation takes place from individual pores, and that 
uh, fact with the peculiarity of diffusion that takes place from uh, 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 diffusing pores give rise to nonlinearities, very strong nonlinearities. By that I mean that if you reduce the, the surface water content or the evaporating area by 50% and sometimes by 90%, you may not see any changes on the evaporative flux on that surface. So this is uh, uh, not a small nonlinearity. In fact, it uh, complicates things or predictions uh, quite a great deal. So what I'd like to talk about today are two problems, two research questions. One involving um, uh, the question is what keeps uh, evaporation rate constant during that constant rate evaporation, even though the surface continuously dries. We take it for granted in hydrology, because all textbooks say that it, there is a period like that, but if you think about it, there got to be some uh, tremendous uh, uh, adjustment of the diffusive machinery at the surface to keep the flux constant despite the fact that the surface uh, water content is dropping, you know, by 30, 40, or 50 percent from original conditions. So the between here and here, you can have a drop in water content of uh, maybe uh, 30 percent. So how this is possible to maintain an, a constant flux from that such a surface? But uh, ironically, what drew our attention was not that, but rather that in some cases, we never had a constant evaporation rate, although we were at stage one evaporation. And I'll define what stage one evaporation is. So to un understand these two phenomena, we have to go to the pore scale processes uh, the, or the exchange that takes place at that interface and try and resolve the physics of what happens there. Related to that are uh, uh, topics that I brought for this uh, conference. Uh, of course, I gave it uh, earlier the, last year with a, a conference that Stefan organized in Amsterdam. And that is what we learned from this evaporation from porous uh, surfaces on a, a, a biotic surface, a leaf surface, uh, on the models for gas exchange and how to uh, and uh, what kind of insights can we learn uh, from this uh, um, physics on evolution of uh, stomata over uh, geologic time scales. So it looks like uh, jumping from uh, one uh, geologic hydrologic uh, topic to uh, to uh, a paleobotany bot uh, topic, but I'll I'll try and show how these are connected. So first, let's look at this problem of uh, how a constant rate evaporation works. Um, as I said, what drew our attention was the fact that uh, in some cases, when the evaporation rate or the potential evaporation rate uh, or the atmospheric demand was high, and in the number, the magic number was about five millimeters per day, we still don't know why that magic number, but we'll get to that at some point. But beyond that, uh, we will not have a constant evaporation rate, but rather we'll have always a dropping evaporation rate. On this figure, I have a, a coarse sand, which is marked with red, and a fine sand marked with blue. Both of them will show this tendency of a dropping evaporation rate for uh, potential rates higher than five millimeters per day. So we were curious about uh, what gave rise to that. Uh, and by process of elimination, we were able to show that it was not the capillary supply from within the porous medium to the surface, but rather the mass exchange from the surface to the atmosphere. I promise to define what stage one is uh, for the purposes of this talk, and stage one is, um, is the stage in which vaporization plane is pinned to the surface of the porous medium. At the end of that stage, uh, the surface will dry and the vaporization plane or the, the phase change plane will migrate into the porous medium, and that will be stage two evaporation, okay? So I can have a stage one evaporation, but not a constant rate evaporation. That's, I guess, the, the difficulty that some hydrologists will find with this uh, uh, depiction. So as I said, by process of elimination, we reduced the problem or we zoomed on the, on the mass exchange between the surface and the uh, air above the surface. And to look at the anatomy of that exchange, uh, we have to zoom in and uh, imagine a collection of pores diffusing vapor to the atmosphere across a, a, a very thin subviscous layer. This is, a viscous, uh, this is the uh, boundary layer. I'll call it boundary layer, but it means, you know, boundary layers can mean different things. But this is the layer over which the uh, momentum is exchanged with the surface, and we have a, a zero velocity at the surface and some average velocity at the top of that boundary layer, a thickness delta. So uh, what happens over a surface, a drying surface, is that as the evaporation takes place, uh, pores uh, are knocked out because this is like a drainage process. 
So you start with the surface, you know, we give colors to pores of different sizes, the smallest are the red. So during the process, you have an invasion of pores, the largest first, the smallest latest. And during that process, the spacing, even in the eye, you can see the average spacings between the pores uh, increases during the drying process. And that's something that will become important uh, later on in describing the phenomena. Uh, the other thing is the boundary layer that I'm talking about ranges from about, say, 10 millimeters on a very uh, slow air velocities to, of the order, to the something of the orders of a few hundred microns uh, under very high velocities, uh, maybe 10 meters per second and so on. So the range over which it changes we, is quite limited. We know what it is. What this boundary layer does, it defines two things. It defines the average gradient for vapor that is the same as if I do it over a free water surface, but it also defines a space in which some uh, vapor shell that I'll describe in the next slide uh, exists. So a thinner boundary layer limit where the, the space for these vapor shells, a thick boundary layer allow their full development. So the modeling of this, and I apologize for this busy slide uh, because I just wanted to uh, mention a few concepts and then move on because I will not solve any equations in this uh, talk. The, concept, the, the elements of this model have been known for quite some time by Suzuki Maeda uh, and Schlunder. But even before that, I think Sherwood did his PhD at MIT on this pro problem of evaporation from sands. Um, and uh, what they solve is basically a, an advection diffusion equation, diffusion of vapor from pores and advection of air uh, flowing over, over the surface for an array of uh, regularly spaced pores. That's what Schlunder and Suzuki Maeda solved. What we did, we expanded this to include uh, differences in pore sizes, uh, the, the invasion of the surface, the drying of the surface, and so on. But this is really not, uh, not very important for the problem. Uh, maybe another comment I should make is that, and I hope uh, the fluid mechanicist here will not throw shoes at me, is that the advection is really not important for this problem. Advection in this problem just sets the boundary condition or the thickness of the boundary layer but is not contributing to the generation of the flux. The flux is generated purely by diffusion from the pores to the, to the mass of air, okay? No shoes, that's good. So uh, we did some experiments to establish a boundary layer uh, in a column you cannot see here very well, but there is a column of sand here uh, sitting in this uh, homemade uh, wind tunnel. We can change the air velocity and get a uh, different evaporation rate that can keep it constant. Uh, and this will be the associated boundary uh, layer with this. So we do this uh, over a free water surface, and we assume that when we have a porous surface, the boundary layer thickness is the same. It's not a bad assumption. It's probably not completely correct. I guess the heart of the uh, results is shown in this uh, 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 image here. Imagine that we fix a boundary layer of 2 millimeters that correspond to uh, 1 meter per second, roughly over a hypothetical surface that is made up of pores of the same size, and the drying of the surface now will be uh, done by increasing the spacings between the pores. So as I increase the spacings between the pores for a fixed window, I reduce the water content. So as I move the water content from a free water surface to a completely dry surface, I look at what happens to the relative evaporation rate relative to a free water surface. If that surface uh, if that porous surface is made up of pores of 10 microns, uh, 10 millimeters for a boundary layer of uh, 2 millimeters, we'll see almost a linear decrease in the evaporation rate with the increased spacing. In other words, as I reduce the evaporating area by 50%, I'll drop the evaporation rate by roughly 50%. If I go to smaller pores, if the surface is made up of pores, say, of the order of plant stomata, say 10 microns, I can drop the, uh, the uh, saturation or the fraction of the pores by almost 90 or 95 percent with almost no impact on the relative evaporation rate. In fact, if I go smaller, the whole plant uh, kingdom will be filling this space uh, left between this uh, curved line and the corner, which means that, uh, oh, okay, well, let's see, uh, before what it means, let's see how it works. What, the way it works uh, to a first approximation just uh, to, um, to give you a, um, a clue about how this works, we start by a surface that is made up of crowded pores. In fact, completely uh, poor, uh, free water surface. The diffusion field, the gradient between the surface and the atmosphere is one dimensional. 
as you increase the spacings between the pores, you start creating these three-dimensional vapor shells that I mentioned earlier. And the diffusion from this vapor shell is much higher than that from a one-dimensional. You have another dimension for diffusion to take place, another gradient. And that's the, the, that gives rise to a, a flux compensation for the increased spacing. So you increase the spacing and you increase the flux per pore. Um, this, uh, uh, this flux compensation it depends on three length scales. It depends on the size of the pore, on the spacings between the pore, and the size of the, or the thickness of the boundary layer. This is how it looks when you look at the flux per pore. As you reduce the, uh, evaporation, uh, the uh, water content, you see for large pores you have very little increase in the flux per pore. This is a 10 millimeter pore. Whereas for the 10 micron pores, you can have a 15 or even more increase per pore. So this is the evaporation per pore relative to a free water surface of the same area. Okay? So you have a tremendous increase in the evaporation from the surface or from a, the, the pore as you increase the spacing. Uh, just to show this in a kind of a, a cartoon, so we solve here the three-dimensional diffusion over a, a surface that is made up of pores of uh, 100 microns and a boundary layer of uh, 400 microns. Uh, so this is the, uh, the diffusion field, looks like, um, uh, at 40% uh, water content. This will be the evaporation per pore at that uh, water content. And as I flip through this image, you'll see that I increase the spacing, look at the spacing between the pores, and how the field is evolving to a three-dimensional uh, field, and also how the evaporation per uh, pore increases. Of course, now I have very few pores, so the product of these two the product of the flux per pore times the number of pores is not fully compensating, so I have a net drop in the evaporation rate from the surface. So to summarize, I have three ingredients here. I have the, uh, the um, increased spacings between the pores and the increase in flux per pore. The product of the increased flux per pore times how many pores remain active uh, within a, a boundary layer will determine whether I'll have a constant rate evaporation. This will be for thick boundary layers where I have room for the shells to develop and fully compensate for the flux. Or I'll have a dropping uh, uh, rate evaporation be, uh, due to a thin boundary layer that is also associated with high atmospheric demand. So this is basically the, of course, the entire discussion here is made under a constant uh, input energy to the surface. Um, some of the applications for this would be to uh, model evaporation from, a, free water, from a, a drying surface based on, say, remote sensing, where you can measure only the surface water content. So here I'm showing the sur surface moisture content and evaporation rate from some experiments from China, showing the nonlinear relationships. Uh, this is what people do to uh, relate uh, the evaporation rate to water content by uh, assuming an empirical resistance term. This is the, uh, a very nice paper from 94, uh, where the resistance term is plugged into this uh, evaporation term. And what this analysis allows us to do is to remove this empiricism, and we can now predict this resistance term due to the configuration of water over the surface and the pore size of the surface in a closed form expression uh, where, where these uh, predictions can also allow for a, a viscous term adding, adding to the resistance of supply to the surface uh, by uh, hydraulic conductivity. So basically the message is that uh, if you know these this, uh, this, uh, nonlinearities, you can also remove some of the um, empiricism that is involved in remote sensing estimates of uh, evaporation. So to bring me to the second, uh, the second uh, topic of my talk is how this uh, can be used to understand the gas exchange model for plants. Um, what we did is that we looked at the uh, mo basic model for uh, gas exchange. Presently, what uh, plant physiologists do, uh, they measure, uh, they define a resistance to vapor, uh, to gases exchange at the level of the pore. This is really uh, dates back to Brown and Eskom from 1900 add to it a boundary layer resistance, and this is the present model for gas exchange. So plant exchange, uh, gas exchange modelers do not consider the interactions between the neighboring uh, stomata. Uh, this was, uh, I think, 
uh, unfortunate mistake back in the 60s, and I think Eve was in that group at the time, or before your time, Wagonier and Zelich, uh, who uh, uh, argued that uh, the, sp the for most plants, the spacing between the stomata is large enough to ignore the interactions. And in fact, it is true for many cases, but it is uh, intimately linked to how big is the boundary layer. And in fact, we can show that uh, for data of Bangi uh, from uh, uh, 53, that if you, if you ignore the, uh, the effect of the, uh, of the stomatal interaction, like today in the gas exchange models, you have a, an overestimation of the evaporative flux or transpiration of uh, something between 15 and 20 percent. And in some cases, for very low evaporating area, this is the stomata size S and the density D. So this is the fraction of the leaf that evaporates. Another remarkable thing to, re to keep in mind, the evaporating area of the leaf is very, very small. So as you can see, the, there is a constant bias because of the neglect of a resistance term that, that involves uh, spacing between stomata. It's not ground shattering. You can do it. You can add it uh, to any of the, uh, of the measurements that people do with the, with the LICOR or other uh, gas exchange chamber. But it is a bias that is really should be, should be removed, and it's easily removed. Uh, one of the applications of this uh, model, uh, we uh, selected to look at uh, very long time scales where we have a huge range of uh, stomata size and density. So I'm, I'm taking you now to the uh, uh, geological time scale to plant evolution. Uh, these are some data from uh, uh, the fossil record of uh, stomata size and density uh, uh, over time, over the geological time, and the striking feature in this is that uh, plants change their strategy from uh, a few large stomata early on in the eon to uh, many, few, many smaller sm stomata at present day. Uh, this is shown here as a function of CO2, not a function of time, showing that from early in the eon, the product of the stomata size time density was about, I don't know, 2%. It went through some peak as the atmospheric CO2 was dropping. The plant strategy was to increase the, uh, the area for intake of CO2, basically. And then from a point uh, onward, the plant uh, could not keep up with the... Uh, well, I mean, the strategy of the plant was basically to switch to a smaller stomata uh, and reduce the evaporating area. So basically, this uh, strategy, this is uh, the same SD as a function of time. I don't know if you can see the inset very well, but just tells you this is not a monotonous process. There was ups, ups and downs. Okay. So uh, what all this means is that because we have in our resistance model now both tomato size uh, and density and spacing, we can calculate or recalculate the gases resistance afforded by the different configuration of uh, fossil record uh, leaves, and try and reconstruct what would have been the picture of the plant water use efficiency under a very uh, long 400 million years of uh, dropping CO2 levels. Uh, so we do the calculation uh, uh, using uh, our model, or it's not our model, it's actually Bang's model, uh, for, with some assumptions that, uh, that are quite common uh, uh, about the constancy of the temperature, the constancy of the uh, potential evaporation of BPD over that period, or relatively constant. And we calculate uh, some, uh, uh, the uh, evaporative losses from leaves uh, as a function of CO2. So notice that CO2 is not exactly a surrogate for time because there were ups and downs during those 400 million years. But it's, it's a fair, fairly uh, similar to the time axis here. Uh, this will be the data that uh, Franks and Beerling, uh, some, uh, some leading figures in this uh, analysis, have been able to calculate with their very, uh, um, I don't want to say complicated, but full model. Um, and we also use their data from the, uh, from the record that I actually, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't show you previously. This is their data, their, this is their interpretation of the SD evolution. Uh, this is the evaporating area of leaves. Uh, plugging in the same model and this is the lines we get. So basically, there are symbols from their model and the line that we calculate based on their presumed evolution of a, a plant evaporating area 
match quite well, but they are different than the ones that we calculate based on our model. We also calculate the photosynthetic assimilation rate for the same uh, evolution using Gabby's uh, model uh, with a small change of uh, using the carboxylation rate uh, based either on, uh, on the uh, uh, diffusion resistance or on the CO2 concentration as uh, Stefan and Debor uh, have done. Both of them produce uh, fairly similar results of the uh, assimilation rate versus CO2. When you take the ratio of these two, here is a surprise. What most models will, will predict, uh, those that are assuming that the water use efficiency is a coupled ratio, it's almost inherent ratio, uh, uh, they'll get this uh, falling line of water use efficiency with uh, dropping CO2. In other words, throughout the plant uh, uh, evolution, uh, water use efficiency constantly drop with the dropping atmospheric CO2. What we find here in this uh, independent estimate of the uh, uh, plant transpiration and plant assimilation rate is that initially there was a drop as the CO, as the CO2 was uh, dropping, but then the plant through refinement of the configuration of stomata size and density was able to maintain a constant water use efficiency across about 200 million years or 300 million years and only when the uh, atmospheric level drops to roughly 1,200 milli, uh, ppms that, uh, that uh, no adjustment of the configuration was possible and both of uh, all the models basically agree about the water use efficiency. And that, I guess, uh, uh, granted us the uh, award of the most rejected paper, and at least in my career, and it's uh, hopefully being solved uh, these days. Um, the meaning of that uh, or the explanation for that actually lies in looking at details what happens to the uh, evaporation and, uh, and assimilation over time, chronologically. What happened is that initially both of these increased with increasing of plant evaporating area to the apex of that uh, parabola. And from then on, uh, because of the evolution of the atmospheric CO2, uh, plant uh, uh, uptake rate was dropping whereas plant uh, transpiration rate through the refinement of the um, resistance, gases the resistance, was uh, able to be maintained. And in fact, uh, uh, most people will take this uh, uh, GW or the, uh, the stomata resistance to, as a function of a plant evaporating area and put a line here, but in fact there is a hysteretic loop that uh, matches the apex of this uh, evolution of the um, plant uh, uh, fossil record. So I have to summarize here. And uh, uh, we showed you that uh, evaporation from discrete pores give rise to nonlinear effects that are relatively easy to explain. The three characteristic lengths in this problem are the size of the pores, the spacings between the pores, and the thickness of the subviscous layer. All of these uh, can be uh, uh, known for a drying surface and definitely for an, for an evaporating leaf. Um, and uh, I didn't show you evidence, but the process itself is to totally dominated by diffusion. Advection here has very little effect other than setting the boundary condition. Of course, it's not that little. Uh, we applied these uh, understandings to, uh, to uh, maybe uh, correcting a bit the uh, gas diffusion model that is presently used and, uh, and uh, looked at it, at uh, the implication of that correction for estimates of water is efficiency over the uh, geological uh, record showing that, um, that there is a bit of asymmetry between the plant assimilation and plant transpiration, uh, not because the diffusion part is the difference, but because there is a whole biogeochemical, uh, uh, biogeochemical, biochemical uh, machinery behind the uptake of CO2 that affects the resistance, the overall resistance that is not present in the loss of water to the atmosphere. And that gives some asymmetry that is reflected in the historical water is efficiency. I'd like to thank uh, funding agencies, the uh, Swiss National Foundation, uh, DFG, the German uh, National Foundation, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Ibrahim, Peter, Nima, and of course, uh, Shmuel Asurino sits in the crowd, and you for your patience. Thank you. I think we have time for one question.